This is a Tracking the Tropics update with a certified most accurate weather team at First Coast News. Well, let's take a look at the tropics. Of course, Tropical Storm Melissa is the big topic here on our Thursday morning. This is the 11 o'clock update from the National Hurricane Center. I'm meteorologist Robert Spetta. And, you know, these updates, we always try our best to not hype, not overemphasize things because when the real serious stuff comes, we want to make sure you're, you're taking it serious. Um, with this one, you know, it's serious, it, it, especially for Jamaica at this point. They're expecting a cat for just off the southern coastline of Jamaica here. Puts them in the right front quadrant, and it's moving slow. So a solid 24 to potentially 48 hours of consistent tropical storm strength winds, as well as heavy rainfall expected for that island. So... Let's break this down. Let's get the latest information on it. Right now, it's moving towards northwest at only two miles per hour. Uh, something to note, though, you know, we've been talking about this rapid intensification. <clears throat> and uh, yes, that's going to take place, but not yet. Uh, take a look at the winds right now, 45 miles per hour. Yesterday, they were at 50. Uh, the pressure has actually rose a little bit. And the reason is, if we pull back the picture, look at all these clouds kind of shearing off towards the north and east. You kind of see it right there. See all this? That is all due to a big dip in the jet stream kind of pulling along. And it's kind of skewing the northern portions of this away. With that said, after that moves away, this is going to continue to slowly work its way towards the west. And that's the reason why we have this slight turn towards the north, by the way, is because of that trough kind of pulling it along. But then it's going to escape that and slowly turns west. And you can see as it goes from a tropical storm all the way up to about Saturday here. And then it changes. The, 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 the switch just flips right away as that trough exits and it moves into this area much more favorable for development and then it gets up to that cat three to cat four intensity so expected to become a major hurricane significant flooding possible in jamaica and then it could be turning towards north over cuba those are some of the main headlines i want you to take away from this specific update on melissa so yeah winds right now 45 miles per hour moving towards the north and west at only two miles per hour pressure is down to one 1,003 uh, millibars. And we take a look, actually, the warnings out right now on this one. Um, tropical storm warnings in place, or excuse me, tropical storm, um, the, excuse me, hurricane watches in place now for Haiti and a hurricane warning for Jamaica. I want to make sure I get that right because that's kind of important here. Trying to pull up any of our social media, see if I can take any of your questions if you are watching this on our live side of things, just to um, kind of get some feedback from you all as well. So yeah, I see uh, no comments on there just yet, but if you do comment, I'll do my best to uh, reply to you here right away. All right, so Let's take a look, actually, at um, the rainfall outlook here as we go ahead uh, through the next, well, 72 hours first. And this is just going to take us out to about Thursday, heading into Friday here, where we continue to see that heavy rainfall across parts of Haiti over towards eastern areas of uh, Jamaica. But this only goes out through Friday. And you already see there's spots that indicate upwards about a half a foot of rainfall out over the ocean, but you got to extrapolate this out. Now, I'm not going to put this any further out because I think the model is going to have a lot of a lot of errors in it just based on the uncertainty of the forecast and how slow it's moving. But I do want to stress that I do anticipate j upwards of a half a foot to a foot of total precipitation in parts of Jamaica here. And you can even see the timeline. Let's take a look through Friday, it just starts to approach with tropical storm strength winds in eastern Jamaica. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, it, it, it still is lingering over that island there. Um, and yeah, it, it even still going to be looking at tropical storm strength winds, parts of uh, Hispaniola, specifically Haiti. And then eventually it makes that turn towards the north over Cuba. And this is what our ensembles look like now. There is increasing confidence. I know the last few days we've been saying there's a lot of low confidence in it. Um, it's still a little uncertain on the exact timing of that churn when this is going to get picked up by the next trough that's going to push it on through. But there is confidence that it will kind of work its way towards the west and turn off towards the north and east, following behind the next trough. And actually, this particular model, you can kind of see that here. So as we go ahead through Friday, Saturday, and the Sunday, see the storm that's kind of in the north, that's 
top left of your screen. It's over Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. You got some rainfall kicking on it. And let's scroll this ahead a little bit more. That moves over the First Coast. In fact, on Monday for the Jacksonville area here at First Coast News, we have a weather impact alert in place because of those increasing showers on Monday, especially for the morning commute. Well, as that same system works its way towards the east, off of the east coast, this is what is going to be the catalyst for the turn towards north. So a lot of people have been asking, well, what's going to stop it from keep on going out towards the Gulf. And the, 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 what's stopping it is that system, that weather system and the high pressure ridge that's gonna come in behind it, basically kind of like a fish hook, grab this and pull it off. And uh, these systems are not gonna wanna run towards high pressure. That's not how they work. They're like water flowing downhill. So if you got a high pressure ridge coming in behind this low by Monday and the Tuesday, that's gonna basically stop it and cause it to cause the, make that shift towards the north and east. So that's an important note, it's all about the timing of that weather system is going to impact the southeast Sunday and the Monday and how that is going to hook this and turn it towards the northeast for our friends across Cuba. There will be Americans involved, by the way, uh, with this storm system. If you are curious, um, I know a lot of you watching this are probably American, probably here from the first coast, uh, and it's not Puerto Rico. By the way, Puerto Rico will see some rain bands. It's Guantanamo Bay, actually, which is located in uh, southeastern areas of Cuba. You see that little inlet right there? See that? That um, that's that's known as um, Prior Navy Gitmo Guantanamo Bay. Got a couple thousand Americans out there who will be probably getting direct impacts from this storm system. They go through a core system of conditions of readiness. It's a little different than hurricane warnings, but basically sets you up for like how the commands kind of make their way through uh, preparing for this uh, storm system. But yeah, um, one of our US Navy bases are actually probably gonna take a big hit from this storm system, if you were curious. Uh, here's a look at the ensembles, the GFS versus the ECMWF, GFS and blue ECMWF in yellow. And I think this does give you another kind of good idea idea of it's, this is interesting the gfs the latest run still wants to hook it over hispaniola a lot earlier than the ecmwf i think that's a little bit of an outlier the euro that one in yellow along with the google ai model a lot of our high resolution hurricane models kind of linger this closer to Jamaica before making that turn towards the uh, north. And I think that's why the NHC also continues to show that in the outlook. And I think the GFS is more or less kind of showing this trough right now, kind of pulling it off, which still possible. And that would be the best case scenario overall, but bad news for Hispaniola. So, yeah. By the way, this shear that we're seeing, if you are curious about shear, that's simply um, difference in wind direction with height. So if you get a little bit of uh, blowing on this in the upper levels, it causes it to lean and... Um, it's not good for tropical systems. It kind of disrupts the machine, if you will. And there's another look at the GFS. But for now, it does look like this storm system, the right front quadrant of it, is probably going to be closer to Jamaica. And you're curious about the right front quadrant, why we're talking about it being so bad. Um, I'll show you the uh, this little package here. This explains kind of the dirty side of a storm and why it's important to know the impacts from it. So I'm gonna give it over to our meteorologist, Lee Southwick on that. The dirty side of a storm refers to the area of a hurricane or tropical system where you'll find the highest winds, highest storm surge, and the greatest tornado threat. So what side of the storm is that? Well, generally it's the northeast side of the storm, or more simply put, the right side of the storm. But it also depends on which direction the storm is moving. If it's traveling in a northern direction, the dirty side will be more on the direct right hand or eastern side. If the storm is traveling in a more western direction, the dirty side will be more on top of it. So what makes it so dirty? It's all about the wind direction and a little math. For example, if a storm is moving north at 30 miles per hour and has wind speeds of 100 miles per hour, then the storm will produce winds of 130 miles per hour on the right dirty side. While on the left side, winds move in the opposite direction of the storm's movement, so they'll be slower at about 70 miles an hour. It's important to remember though, as the storm grows stronger, every side becomes dangerous. Meteorologist Lee Southwick, First Coast News on your side. 
So yeah, that's a that's a good little kind of explainer on why it's important to know what the dirty side of a storm is. And the dirty side of this one is going to be that right front quadrant. It, uh, I'm telling you, if this gets up to Cat 4, Cat 5 near Jamaica, it's going to have that classic buzzsaw shape. Anywhere near the core of the storm, of course, is going to be bad, but that right side, especially tornadoes and things like that, that could extend as far away as Haiti over towards uh, Cuba. But once again, I can't stress enough, the slow movement of this is really going to be the catalyst for some devastating rainfall. For specifically Jamaica, if this forecast follows through, um, and even if it drifts towards the north, it could be Haiti. It's still going to be slow moving at that point, but um, serious stuff here. Now, we got some people flying into these storms right now, by the way, uh, hurricane hunters. They've been uh, doing some laps around it, giving you the lowest pressure readings. In fact, th this is the latest pass. And you notice how they're actually flying kind of towards the west of the bulk of the um, convection. The, all the higher cloud tops here is another one. They're flying around. They found that lowest pressure rate there, 1,002 millibars. Um that's because this is displaced a little bit to the left. That's because the is having that shear act on it. And once this gets a little bit more organized and escapes that shear, you'll see the convection relocate a little bit closer to where the hurricane hunters are doing their laps there and trying to pinpoint the exact low level center pressure, which is all stuff that gets ingested into our weather models uh, to help make the uh, forecast that much more accurate. And, um, yeah, so, you know, we're talking about the forecast here. I'm going to leave you with the track here one more time as this intensifies. This is for the 11 o'clock update. Don't have any questions here on our socials right now, so I'm not going to address any of those as of our live update here. But you can always reach out to me at any later time. I always try my best to respond to you. Uh, but, you know, I was just talking about the hurricane hunters flying through there, and I actually got to talk to a colonel with the hurricane hunters, Colonel Rickart, um, recently about why they do what they do and what goes into flying into the heart of a hurricane. So I'm going to leave you with this, my conversation with Colonel Rickard on the Hurricane Hunters. The Hurricane Hunters are a vital tool when it comes to tropical weather forecasting. They fly into the heart of hurricanes, so we can get that initialization data to ingest into weather models and help make that forecast that much more accurate. But who is flying these planes into the middle of the hurricanes? Well, I had the opportunity to talk to one of the hurricane hunters. That is Colonel Ryan Rickard about why they do what they do. So, I mean, we all we all know that it started very, very early in the middle of World War II. Um, there's no there's no replacement for it, really. There's there's nothing that can provide the data that the aircraft can provide. There's there's no observations over the ocean that, you know, with aircraft flying through it, the, the aircraft is equipped with weather information and sens you know, sensors that are collecting that and then we're disseminating it. So it's, it's truly vital for the Hurricane Center and uh, for the meteorologists and the forecasters in the West Coast as we've expanded our winter season mission too, where we're collecting atmospheric data over data sparse areas. All right, so let's say you're going to go fly into a hurricane. Could you take me through a day in the life of a of a Air Force hurricane hunter that is going to be going out and going into a storm? So really, it starts the day prior. The day prior, the Hurricane Center asks um, the aircraft units what if they can support whatever they're asking, requirements for flights, for whatever storms are out there that we can reach um, from whatever base we're at. And then that basically starts this, sets the stage for the crews getting built, people volunteering for set a flight at whatever time. And then they go into a crew rest. They have to have a 12 hour period prior to their flight that we're whether resting and being ready and basically um, getting the sleep that they need in order to conduct that mission the next day. And then um, basically roughly three hours prior, you'll get alerted to come in to the unit and go prepare and go out on that flight and about two hours everyone r arrives two hours prior to the flight and then you start collecting the information you start providing the crew what we're going to do where we're going etc and then about that takeoff time that's when everybody's on the aircraft you're taking off and you're heading towards the, the location where you're going to hunt that storm or or uh, basically collect all the data for that storm 
Um, and the missions can run anywhere from you know six to 12 hours. It just depends on how far it is to get to that. And then uh, basically what the Hurricane Center has asked us to do, you know, if there's certain different things, ob objectives they have us uh, basically finding out. The planes that the Hurricane Hunters use are unique. They have a lot of special equipment on board, but what's interesting is that they are not much different from normal military aircraft. Yeah, so the the misconception is is that that C-130 that the C-130s that we have we have ten of them are built differently and like reinforced or you know armored or do whatever that they're not they're actually not um, they don't have extra steel plates or you know uh, anything extra on that aircraft to make it more safe they do have weather instrumentation on it which that's where the WC-130 comes from that W means weather so it's weather configured. We have instrumentation, we have the crew on there, on board to collect that information and, and uh, provide it to our customers. The one thing I will say that it does, it, it, has, um, it has the nose radar on there, just like other C-130s, but we have a software that enhances it, that el allows us to determine, um, I would say, it allows us to determine whether or not there are um, tornadic signatures. It helps with the, the reflectivity of it and uh, gives us more um, fidelity of what's actually happening in front of the aircraft. So who is flying into these hurricanes? It's a lot more than just the one pilot. Yeah, so we have two pilots, uh, the aircraft commander and then a co-pilot. Uh, they're obviously flying the aircraft. We also have navigators on our airplanes. There used to be a lot of navigators across the Air Force and C-130s and other aircraft. They've really um, basically cut back on that, but the navigator provides a, a crucial role in ours where they, they're looking at that radar to help assist us and tell us what might or might not be you know good things to fly through, et cetera. Um, and then we have uh, the flight meteorologist and then the load master, the drop zone operator in the back. They're the ones that are collecting all the data uh, the, the meteorologist is telling the, drop, the load master where to drop those signs because they're not technically weather experts or have weather backgrounds. They're basically just following orders on what we want to do. And then we are basically, the meteorologists are conducting the entire mission and what, you know, meeting the objectives of the customers, telling them where we need to go next or what we need to do next. And then we're ensuring that that weather information that's getting soft off the airplane, sent off the airplane is, you know, as accurate as it possibly can be. Now, I guess my next question is about in-flight. So how many, if you know this number offhand, I bet you do, how many storms have you penetrated? And <laughs> what is the one that you were like, oh, okay, all right, hold on. And maybe maybe like you lost a little like um, kind of color in your, in your face or anything right. like that. I actually do not know the exact oh, okay. number, but I know relatively. I've, I've been through hurricanes roughly 150 to 175 times, somewhere in that range. Uh, last year, I went through, I think, 31 times uh, a hurricane penetration. So I'm um, getting up there. I've been there for 10 years. So been able to I have quite a, a decent amount of experience in doing it. Um, and then I would say the, the one, there's been a handful of wow or oh my, you know, moments. But the one that I just, I've been kind of harping on while I've been here is the Hurricane Ir Irma experience kind of flew it three or four times in its beginning stages all the way up to a cat five. And uh, the one of the, at, when it deepened and it hit its peak intensity, that was one of the ones that I was just like, oh my gosh, um, it was really rough and it was near land. So we, we got rocked pretty good. So what advice from a hurricane hunter would you have for the general public? A lot of the times the general public doesn't really understand, you know, what impacts they're, they're gonna experience at their house or in their area that they live. So. I mean, the best way to understand that is to listen to their local emergency managers and their the communicators and the leaders of their community to tell them, hey, if they're telling you to leave, you, you really need to leave. It's doesn't, it's, it's a freebie. Leave. Why would you stay? You know what I mean? Like, it just, it doesn't make sense to me that to ride a storm out when you really don't know what's going to happen. So. So I want to say a big thank you to Colonel Rickart for talking with me about how the hurricane hunters operate. If you want more information, be sure to stop by firstcoastnews.com slash hurricane central. I'm meteorologist Robert Spetta.